I told you about the Twisted Fae? Those soldiers who delved too far into the dark magic in order to gain more power and ended up losing themselves to its corruption. It was not an overly common thing, for it tended to cost their army more than one soldier when the creature would start its killing spree. They were careful to keep their people away from that line, but it was a thin line that may not have ever existed for those who fell. The Twisted Bay, the Broken Ones, the Corrupted. These were the stories Sam grew up with, meant to instruct the little ones from wandering too far from home. The danger was real, though, and the few who survived facing those wretched creatures did so by fleeing, leaving their friends behind, or by managing to outnumber them. The creatures were either avoided at all costs, or hunted, for even the Fae did not want to risk them getting too close to their borders. The smarter ones hid deep within the woods, far from civilization, and they preyed on any fools who dared venture too deep into the unknown. They tended to stick to their territories, though, and whenever one was found, it was communicated far and wide. So, I believed we were safe, or as safe as we could be given the situation. Don't look now, but we're being followed. What and where? It's one of the Twisted Ones. It's been following us for a few minutes now, perhaps longer. I can't say for sure. Yeah, I thought I saw something as well, but I thought it might be a scout. Are you sure it's a twisted one? Let's keep walking and act casual. Now that you've mentioned it, I'm picking up on something behind us to the left. If it's a twisted one, it's either guarding its territory or... <laughs> it's hunting us. We continued with caution, looking for a place to find shelter and escape this creature's attention. Sam looked to me, and I looked to James, following his lead as he seemed to have the most awareness of the creature's movements. How he knew what to look for and how to escape his attention was a question wandering through my head in need of being addressed, for not many survived facing such a thing, but this was not the time to ask. At best it would be distracting, and at worst, the creature would understand our speech and know that we were on to it. So I held my tongue as James ushered us into what was left of a mostly stone building. Oh, please tell me you know how to deal with these things. Sort of. Back in... where I grew up, they told us about how to deal with them. Are you familiar with the Twisted Fang? The ones who went too far and lost themselves to the dark magic? Yes, we are familiar. Now is not the best time for a story, so if you have any information that can help us right now, let's skip to that. They're driven by baser instincts like hunger and rage and things like that. They like to play with their food. Very territorial. Weak to iron and not much else. We were taught to always have iron on us, because sometimes the Fae would drive the Twisted Ones toward our town. Viv has more iron on her than I do, because... I can't handle anything more than a small amount, but in the in-between, everybody carries some. I have run into these creatures occasionally on my journey, but always at a distance. Even so, I carry iron and salt and a few other things that could help us. So we have supplies. Good. And all we need is a plan. What are you looking at me for? You know the most about how to deal with these things. You have knowledge, you make the plan, we follow your lead. Now stop second-guessing yourself and tell us what to do. Okay. Show me what you have. I need to know what I'm working with. It took us a few minutes to come up with a plan that was vague enough to be flexible and precise enough to be enacted at a moment's notice. We still did not know for sure if we were being hunted, but it was better to be paranoid than wrong. As James stepped into this confident persona, I could see his self-doubt melting away, like they shoved so far back in his mind that they could not interfere with what was about to happen. That was good, because a split second of indecision could easily result in death. It was in this moment that I saw how much he had changed from when he arrived in the neutral zone. Being kicked out of his home for something that was not his fault had done a number on his confidence. 
He had no knowledge of life outside his town and next to no usable skills, but he never gave up, and so a few years later he was able to take care of himself. All and all who were kicked out made it so long. And here he was, about to save us from a nightmare monster. It made me wonder if he had more skills than we realized. The plan was a simple one. Drawing upon a few tricks for dealing with the fate that had a decent chance of working this situation, though we wouldn't know for sure until we tried it. James and I walked openly, making no attempt to hide our movements to draw the creature's attention to us. I tried to track its movements, but James had better luck than I, so I followed his lead as he tried to direct us away from what we thought might be its territory. At one point, he started leading us through side streets carefully glancing over shoulders to see if we were being followed. It's still following us, even though doing so makes it more exposed. So it's hunting us. I have no interest in being prey. What do you say we find somewhere nice and open and get this whole thing over with? How long will it take your friend to get in place? Not long. He's probably already scouting ahead for a good spot. He'll be ready. That'll make one of us. I became increasingly aware of the creature the closer we got to what was probably the town center. We were nearing the end of the stalking portion of this hunt. Now it had the two of us separated from the pack, it was getting ready to pounce. And then it did. This terrifying, unsettling presence came hurling towards me so fast I almost wasn't able to dodge. I felt it brush against me as I spun and stumbled backwards, fighting to keep my feet underneath me while getting some distance between us. The creature came after me again, but by then I had my iron daggers in hand that recoiled back, hissing on some mix of fear and anger before crouching low. Then it started to circle me, so I circled it, keeping an equal distance between us to make sure it stayed within my line of sight. Keeping its attention on me gave the others a chance to get into position to make their move, but it also left me in a vulnerable position where even a blink could be fatal. As we circled, I tried to take stock of exactly what I was looking at. I could see the signs of where this thing had once been fate, but everything about it was twisted and stretched out of proportion. Limbs bent at all at angles, darkness radiating off its skin and oily tendrils. They must have been attempting some kind of transformation when they snapped, because they looked more like a corrupted creature than a person, with snarling teeth and jagged wings jutting out of their back. And the eyes, intelligent and cruel and blood red mixed with a vile green that instilled fear in me that I still feel remnants of to this day. It growled low in its throat as it stared at me, the sound burbling into an open snarl. With its massive size, I wasn't sure how to take it down beyond using my wits and hoping for the best. The first two attacks were tentative meant to gauge my strength and reflexes before it began its real assault. Then it became a fight for my life, ducking and dodging and slashing and blocking, letting my instinct take over because there's no time for thought. When the arrows came flying, it threw off the creature's attack, enough time to give me a chance to attack back. The daggers did not do as much damage as I hoped but the iron in them was doing something, so I kept up the assault. Until one of its limbs caught me across the stomach, sending me flying back. I scrambled to force myself into a seated position, but the attack I was expecting never came. I looked to the creature and saw James standing before it, hand outstretched, and for whatever reason, the beast did not attack. It stayed completely still, Breathing shallow as I walked up and struck it exactly where James instructed me to. It died instantly. With a threat taken care of, we found another ramshackle building to camp in for the night, and James finally told us his story. You have been listening to Ceasefire, the story of the end of a war that did not end the world. 
This story was written and produced by Brianna Jean as part of Pseudonym Social, a creative podcast network changing reality one story at a time. In this episode, you can hear the voices of Brianna Jean as Vivian, Zadkiel Basky Huff as Sam, David Telstra as James, Jordan Marie as the Druidess. You can support all of our productions over at patreon.com slash pseudonym social. To get more information on this or any of our other shows, check out our website at pseudonymsocial.com.